Our next speaker represents a thing called the slow movement, and I must say the slow movement is gathering speed and is racing towards acceptance. Um, so many of us, so many of us are big city dwellers. We're addicted to the buzz, to the action. People greet each other with, what's going on? What's going on? But when you kind of take them aside and you ask them, what are they going to do with the money? What is the money for? Often they tell you it's to buy the time or to buy that cottage far, far away where they can slow down. So uh, Carl Honoré is the great prophet of the slow movement. He spearheaded it and uh, is up here to uh, join us in a discussion on new approaches to time and space. Think of it, slow email. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm a Canadian myself. I'm from Edmonton, and it's always great to come home. Uh, one reason being that I've always felt that Canada has a slightly slower pace than uh, London, where I live in England. Uh, at least I thought it did, until this weekend I went to a barbecue at a friend's house here in Toronto, and one of his neighbors was there, and he came up and he said, you know, my little boy my, spoke his first real word, his real proper word for the first time. And we all gathered around and said, what was his first word? What was his first word? And he said, Blackberry. <laughs> In the beginning was the word, and the word was Blackberry. Uh, that little encounter reminded me of a story that broke in England not so long ago about a couple that went to the divorce courts, and the judge said, what happened? What went wrong? Why are you here? And the husband spoke first. He said, it's a long story. You know, we married young. We grew apart over the years. But the moment I knew this marriage was dead in the water, that it was finished, was when we were in bed together in an intimate sexual moment, and I was doing something for my wife, you know? And I lifted my head up for a second to catch my breath, as you sometimes have to do. And... <laughs> And I caught her checking her email on the BlackBerry. <laughs> now, there are a couple of conclusions you can draw from a vignette like that. The first is that that English husband really needs to brush up on his technique. The second is a bigger point, and I think it is that collectively, we've lost the ability to switch off, to unplug, to slow down long enough to give ourselves completely to someone else, to a moment. And that's not surprising, is it? Because this is the world that we live in now, a world stuck in fast forward, a world obsessed with speed, with cramming more and more into less and less time for many of us, especially the people in this hall. Every moment of the day feels like a race against the clock. Speed in our culture has become the default setting. When we try to make things better, what do we do? We speed them up, don't we? So we, these days we speed dial, we speed read, we speed walk, we even speed date. And even things that are by their very nature slow, that are designed to shift us into a lower gear, we try and speed them up, too. So my neighbor in London goes to a very popular evening course in speed yoga. <laughs> and this is, no, it, and it, it's, this is for real. This is for time-starved professionals who want to you know, bend their stressed bodies into the lotus position, but they want to do it in 20 minutes instead of a whole hour. And I thought speed yoga was the most absurd manifestation of this roadrunner culture, until a friend of mine in the States got an invitation to a drive through funeral. Just chew on that one for a minute. Now, now these are obviously extreme examples, and, and they're useful for raising a chuckle or two. But they lead us to a, a more serious point, and that is that these days, many of us are so caught up in the headlong dash of daily life, we're so marinated in this culture of speed, that we often lose sight of the damage that it does, the toll that it takes on every aspect of our world and our lives. We've been hearing from several speakers about the damage that turbo capitalism does to the environment. But look how this turbo lifestyle takes a toll on us as people, on our diet, on our health, on our work, on our relationships. We are racing through our lives rather than actually living them. And when, when we get stuck in that fast forward mode, it often takes a shock to the system, a, a wake up call of some kind to make us realize that we've forgotten how to slow down and it's bad for us. And these days, that comes in many forms. For a lot of people, it's, it's, it's an illness, isn't it? That one day you wake up and the body just says, I, I can't take the pace anymore. And you, you've got a breakdown or a burnout or some kind of chronic illness kicks in. Or maybe a relationship goes up in smoke because you haven't had the time or the patience to be with the other person, like the Blackberry couple. Now, my 
wake-up call came when I started reading bedtime stories to my son. And I used to go into his room at the end of the day, and I just couldn't slow down. I'd be sitting on his bed with one foot on the floor, speed reading Snow White. <laughs> Trying to skip a line here, a paragraph there, and sometimes I'm ashamed to say a whole page. And my son, like every small child, knew the book inside out. So we were always quarreling. He'd say, why are there only three dwarves in the story tonight? Or, <laughs> what happened to Grumpy? <laughs> And so what should have been the most relaxed, the most intimate, the most tender, the most magical moment of the day when a dad sits down to read a story to his little boy became instead a, a battle of wills, a war between my speed and his slowness. And this went on for quite a while until I caught myself reading a newspaper article that talked about a series of books called The One Minute Bedtime Story. Snow White in 60 Seconds. And I, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but when I read those words, I thought, hallelujah, you know? <laughs> I'm going to get that whole set FedEx to me from Amazon tomorrow morning, <laughs> express service. But then it was a bit like being in a cartoon and the light bulb goes on over your head and you think, whoa, I mean, has it really come to this? Am I really in such a hurry that I'm prepared to fob off my son with a sound bite at the end of the day? I took a step back and I thought, I, I, something's got to change here or something's going to break. And as a, as a journalist and a writer, the next step was to start asking questions, to go travel around the world and, and investigate this whole speedaholic culture. And what I found pretty soon was that wherever you go nowadays, more and more people are doing the unthinkable. They're slowing down in every walk of life. And they find that contrary to what conventional wisdom tells us, which is that if you slow down, you're lazy, you're boring, you're unproductive, you're roadkill, the opposite turns out to be true. They find that by slowing down judiciously, when it makes sense to, they work better, play better, live better, they do everything better. And in this rising tide of deceleration, around the world lie the seeds of what more and more people now refer to as the international slow movement. Or I'll have to commit a small act of hypocrisy, which is to give you a fast tour of the slow movement, <laughs> just to give, give you a little taster <laughs> of, of where things are going and just how deep and broad and profound this change is, just how, how much we are entering a stage where the tectonic plates really are shifting below the surface. Uh, let's start with food. Uh, we eat badly because we take a high-speed approach to the way we, we to put our food together in the way we eat it. But that is now under threat from the slow revolution. The slow food movement, many of you will have heard of, started in Italy, but has spread across uh, the world, including to here in Canada. There's a, a thriving slow food chapter here. And slow food is based on that very simple, sensible idea that we get a lot more health, nutrition, pleasure, social connection, and cultural meaning from our food when our food is cultivated, cooked, and consumed at a, at a reasonable pace. Slow food, though, is the tip of an iceberg. The organic food movement, uh, the renaissance of the farmer's market, more and more signs that people are yearning to get away from this high-speed, high-turnover approach to what we put on our, on our fork and on our plates. Out of the slow food movement has grown something called Slow Cities, which started in Italy, but again has swept right across Europe and beyond. There are three towns in Canada now that are applying to join the Slow Cities movement. And Slow Cities is about redesigning and rethinking the urban landscape so that people feel that they have the space and the time and the aesthetic surroundings to slow down, to put on the brakes. So they may put in a park bench or create more green space or shut off roads to traffic so that people walk more. In Calgary, there's now a slow homes movement, which is about building more sustainable housing, but also rethinking neighborhoods so that people get back into that great un-North American activity, which is walking, you know, getting to have contact and time with neighbors, family, and friends. The stuff of a life well lived. Now, s slow cities, s slow food, it's not just about stuff out of Italy. The slow revolution is rumbling through every sector of life. You look at sports. A few years ago, things like yoga, tai chi, qigong, pilates looked a little bit flaky and a bit girly even, didn't they? Uh, today, they're everywhere. I mean, we've had two yoga sessions in a conference. Can you imagine chanting um in a conference 10 years ago? And why, why is that? It's because these things work. You're starting to see even in the most testosterone-drenched sports around, you know, hockey, football, um, rugby, players incorporating into their workout routines slower forms of exercise because they give you kind of core strength, they enhance flexibility, but they also cultivate a kind of inner calm, an inner slowness that you build up outside the rink or outside the pitch, but then you take into the battle with you so that even when you're moving quickly, you've got a kind of slow core. And that's what the athletes have always described as being in the zone. 
And what we're talking about here, in a way, is that link between body and mind, which gets blown away in the, in the, in the speed culture. And whenever you talk about body of, and mind, you have to talk about medicine, too, don't you? There's a lot of fast medicine around. It's the quick fix. It's a pill. Let's get it done overnight. There, too, there's a big rethink going on. You're finding uh, doctors, it, countries on both sides of the Atlantic, pushing for more time with their patients so that they can make that human connection and get to understand better what needs to be done. The complementary and alternative health boom that you see all around Canada and, and the world is another sign, I think, that people are yearning to get back to healing therapies that work in sync with nature and a, a deeper, slower, more gentle rhythm. Obviously, many of these alternative therapies are still a little bit dubious, and um, the jury is still out on them. I won't be first in line to get a coffee enema, for instance. But, but others, things like acupuncture, massage, meditation, do have a medical payoff. Body and mind leads us back to sex again, doesn't it? The Brackberry couple. When I first heard that story, I thought, oh, come on, these people are just freaks. But two weeks later, a survey came out showing that 20% of us now are willing to interrupt sex to take a phone on our cell phone, a cell phone call. And even Paris Hilton in her famous sex video, which I hasten to say I've never seen, ap apparently, I don't, I'm, good, I'm having a good authority, that she interrupts her ministrations to take a call. You know, sort of, hi, Nicole. Hot. Uh, <laughs> and even when we do manage to check the Blackberry in the phone at the bedroom door, we still seem to want to speed up the act of love, don't we? Men's Health magazine put out a feature recently with a headline on the front that said, bring her to orgasm in 30 seconds. <laughs> and when, when you talk about, so you know, on your marks, get set, go. When you talk about sex, I think that's one particular area where women and men do part company, isn't it? Uh, I noticed there was a man there in the fifth row, and a few men actually, you know, when I mentioned the 30 second organ, set up a little straighter men's health. What was the addition number there? <laughs> but none of the women did, did they? Um, I mean, it's, it's not surprising that, that that classic song, A Lover with a Slow Hand, was sung by the Pointer Sisters, not the Pointer Brothers. <laughs> I'm not here to say that all fast sex is bad sex. I mean, I like a quickie as much as the next person. And, and as a married man with two small children, I'll take any sex I can get these days, I gotta tell you. <laughs> fast, slow, whatever. But if all the sex you're having is fast sex, then you are missing out. Because it's when we do slow down between the sheets that not only does the body have time to warm up and deliver more bang for your buck, if you like, uh, but, but all of those subterranean connections that happen between two people when they really make love together in one moment, the, the, phys the psychological, the emotional, the, the spiritual even, they begin to to kick in and happen. And so you're starting to see people trying to slow down in the bedroom. You know, we all laughed at Sting a few years ago when he talked about making tantric love to his wife for hours on end. And, and some of us worried for her health as well. Um, <laughs> look around today and couples of all ages flocking to workshops to relearn that lost art of slow lovemaking. There's even in Italy where they know always how to find their pleasure point, don't they? They've launched an official slow sex movement. I'm hoping that'll be my next conference call <laughs> that I speak at. Um, sex, children, same, same thing. Kids infected by the virus of hurry, they're out of the womb, it's baby Einstein DVDs, we've got to get an alpha child out, don't we? Uh, they've got schedules that would give a CEO heartburn. But that, there too, in the parenting, child rearing, people are starting to rethink. You're finding towns right across North America um, setting aside what they call slowdown days or um, relaxed days where extracurriculars and homework are cancelled and the kids are given time just to rest, uh, hang out, or uh, just be kids. And the same message is coming from elite universities. Harvard University now sends out a letter to all its freshmen saying, welcome to Harvard. We want you to reach for the stars. We want you to be the best that you can be. But in order to do that, you've got to avoid getting overscheduled. You've got to leave hours and hours in your timetable in the week when all you do is just hang out, wander around, you know, sleep a siesta, sit under an apple tree like Isaac Newton did. That's Harvard University the Mount Olympus of academic achievement. And the title of that letter is simply, Slow Down. Now you may be thinking, okay, fine. Food, cities, sex, medicine, kids, uh, sport. I can see how slow works there, but the workplace, come on, give me a break. You know, you slow down your toast. Wrong. Obviously in the new economy, we have to be fast. There are moments to be fast. But if you're, if you're always fast, then you're missing out. You're burning out, you're making mistakes, you're not thinking as creatively as you should. And that's why in the workplace you're seeing more and more push, the corporate world, embracing this slow idea. And it takes, I think, three forms. One is simply working less. Working less, working better by working fewer hours. You look at the Nordic economies, 
They do many fewer hours than we do in the Anglo-Saxon world, and yet their economies rank among the most competitive in the world. PricewaterhouseCooper in the United States recently decided that it, its staff were just working too many hours, so now they shut down the whole company for three weeks a year and say, go home and take a holiday. <laughs> That's working less. You can also stop during the day, because it turns out that the brain research shows that the human brain cannot work in high gear effectively through a whole day. You need, you need to shift gear, you need to slow down. It's when you're in those relaxed moments that you slip into that deeper, richer, more nuanced, more creative mode of thought that psychologists actually call slow thinking. That's why your eureka moments come when you're sunning yourself in the backyard or walking the dog. They don't come when you've got five minutes to your next deadline. So you're seeing companies saying, okay, you know what, take a lunch break, or here's a room where you can meditate, or listen to whale music, or just put your feet up. When you talk about the workplace and speed, you have to talk about technology as well, don't you? Uh, these gadgets, I mean, coming back to the BlackBerry, I hate to demonize the BlackBerry, I mean, come on, I'm a Canadian, I'm a, you know, it's a proud Canadian export, and it's a great thing. But just like every other gadget, the cell phone, whatever, they all have a little red button that says off on it. And the trouble is that we don't use that button enough. And it's doing us harm. It's infiltrating our private lives. It's making it impossible for us to be in a moment, but it's also making us dumber. This report came out from Hewlett Packard recently, warning that the constant barrage of electronic interruptions in the workplace causes our IQ levels to fall 10 points. 10 points, that's the equivalent, or double the equivalent, of smoking a joint. So we have this idea in our speed-obsessed world that being always on, always connected, being the guy who instantly replies to every email, every voice call, every fax, that that's somehow going to make you an uber-productive master of the universe. But actually, it's more likely to turn you into Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> or Keith Richards, take your pick. I was in Australia a little while ago, and I picked up the leading business magazine, and they had a huge feature on the future for Australian businesses. How are we going to survive in the cutthroat, fast-changing, fast-paced world economy? And they distilled all of their wisdom down into five tips, and the top tip, again, it's a bit spooky, isn't it? The top tip for Australian businesses, get ahead, was slow down. So I think wherever you look these days, the message is the same, that, that less is often more and that, that slower is often better. And I think that we're moving towards a, a cultural tipping point. For 150 years at least, we've been on a constant upward curve of acceleration. Everything's been getting faster. The pulse of everything has been quickening. And for the most part, you gotta say that that was fine, because speed was doing more good than bad. But now we've entered the domain where the law of diminishing returns has kicked in. And most of, I th most of us, I think, in this hall realize that these days, speed, our obsession with speed, with doing everything faster, is actually nowadays doing us more harm than good. And that's why this slow revolution is gathering speed. It is picking up pace. And slow, despite the name, is not about doing everything at a snail's pace. You don't have to leave a big city and go live in a shack in the Rockies to be slow, because being slow, with a capital S, is really a state of mind. It's about approaching every moment, seeking to do whatever it is you're doing at the right speed. Sometimes fast, sometimes slow, all those speeds in between, and sometimes completely stopped and completely still. It's about trying to do everything, not as fast as possible, but as well. A lot of that applies on a kind of personal level, obviously. But there's a bigger question here, too. I think a slower society will be a gentler society, a society that's less rushed, less frenetic, but also at the same time, weirdly and paradoxically, more dynamic, more creative. It will also be more healthy, happier, more humane, and longer living. So that's, in a way, I guess, the idea that I've brought to the table this week is that this very simple notion that, that slower really can be better in the 21st century actually does work. And it's an idea that is so profoundly countercultural now, but so profoundly necessary, that it, it is an idea that can change the world. It has certainly changed my world. I'm still a fast, you know, I, I, like, I like speed. I live in London, I work with deadlines, I, play f hockey and squash and fast. Well, I, like, I like to go fast, but I've also got back onto speaking terms with my inner tortoise. And what that means in practice is that I've found, or I'm close, closer now than I've ever been to that balance of doing things at the right, the right speed, and I feel a lot healthier. I feel I've got a lot more energy and get up and go. I'm not so exhausted all the time. I feel happier because 
I take pleasure from things rather than just getting through them. I feel more productive at work. And most importantly, I suppose, my relationships feel a lot tighter because I'm there in the moment with people. I'm not dialing a phone number or thinking about the next thing on my to-do list. My wife is always saying to me, you've got to stop talking about our sex life in public. So, so I can't tell you whether or not being a lover with a slow hand gets you laid more. But I'll leave it up to your imagination to, to work that one out. But I can tell you that the bedtime story ritual has been completely changed. I go into my son's room at the end of the day, and you know, we slow down to his pace. There are always seven dwarves in the story now. And, and we had these conversations that we never had before when I was skipping pages and lines and whole, par whole paragraphs. And the other day, there was a kind of Hollywood ending where I was flicking through his homework book, and they'd been given an assignment to say, what do your, what do your parents do for you? And my son had written at the top of the page under dad, he'd written, my dad is the best story reader in the world. And I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> this really works, this slowing down. But then, of course, I spoiled the moment by thinking, why didn't you say that two years ago? I could have ended my book on that note. <laughs> But that's not very slow, is it? So let's, <laughs> let's push that thought to the side and go back to the first thought, which is, wow, this slowing down really does work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kyle.